Pancake everyone. We are used to seeing hired killers in popular culture depicted as monsters with a kind heart. They avenge the killing of dogs, stand up for children, and if they kill for money, they always end up repenting. However, in real life things are somewhat different. Here's how seasoned mobsters described one of the cruelest hitmen. He's a real bastard and the devil incarnate. He tormented his victims and killed people for fun in his free time. Each murder brought him both pleasure and tens of thousands of dollars. You'll find out who exactly we're talking about later. Abe Rillis, the canary. With all due respect, I can handle any cop in the city, because it counts to ten before pulling the trigger. I don't count, Rillis replied to the judge when he said that someday he would get a life sentence or a couple of bullets in the back of the head. Abe Rillis was born in 1906 in Brooklyn to Austrian Jewish immigrants. In his childhood, he was an incorrigible troublemaker, earning the nickname Lil Twister, in honor of the legendary gangster from the Lower East Side. Abe's family lived in poverty, so there was no talk of a proper education for their son. Besides, young Rillis wasn't inclined towards academics. After completing eight grades, he started working as a golfer for three Shapiro brothers, owners of entertainment venues in Brooklyn. In 1921, Abe ended up behind bars for the first time for stealing chewing gum. After serving four months in a juvenile colony, Abe firmly decided that the underworld adrenaline and easy money were his calling. However, what began with harmless thefts quickly escalated into cold-blooded murder. After his release, Abe, along with his childhood friend Bugsy, got involved in the slot machine business in New York. Fate brought Willis back into contact with the Shapiro brothers, but the alliance didn't last long. After another shootout, Rillis eliminated the brothers and soon became the chief hitman of a criminal organization with the expressive name Murder, Inc. The organization was involved in cleaning up criminal ranks and during its operation eliminated more than 400 people. Rillis personally killed 11 of them and assisted in finishing off, drowning and burning in many other cases. To eliminate victims, Lil Twister often used an ice pick. Despite this, he operated so cleanly that he walked free after each of his 42 arrests. In February 1940, the FBI arrested Rillis for the 43rd time along with several other gangsters. The accused killers were separated into different rooms and subjected to interrogation. Rillis agreed to tell everything he knew but made a condition. He would not be charged for any of the murders. The prosecution reluctantly agreed. And then Rillis, with his photographic memory, began implicating his former colleagues one by one. His testimonies filled 25 volumes. Mafia bosses didn't expect Abe Rillis to sing, and they soon ordered a hit on the canary. On November 12, 1941, at 7 a.m., the battered body of a 37-year-old Abe Rillis was found in the hotel parking lot. Later, people would say about him, the canary could sing, but couldn't fly. Thomas Petera, or Tommy Karate, nightmare of narcotics dealers. He was born on December 10, 1954, in a candy merchant's family. He was a quiet and modest child who was bullied by his classmates. But everything changed after Tommy watched the movie The Green Hornet. Inspired by Bruce Lee's acting, Patera became eager to learn Kung Fu. Without much thought, he scraped together some money and flew to Tokyo, where he began training in martial arts. Tommy returned to America as a karate master, earning him his nickname. Soon after, Tommy got a job with the Banana Mafia family, where he became one of the main executioners. He was not squeamish. He killed with guns as well as with his bare hands. The karate expert especially enjoyed dealing with drug dealers. Once Tommy killed two Colombian drug dealers and then sold the cocaine he found. Another time, the hitman got rid of a heroin supplier from the Middle East, known as Sig Sig, by dismembering him into six parts and burying them in different corners of a landfill. The killer usually transported bodies to the Staten Island Cemetery in New York. He believed that the moist soil in that area would decompose the flesh faster. Tommy Karate was a cautious man. He had a genuine interest in pathology, as he wanted to learn how to dismember bodies in a way that would make them unidentifiable. He also feared that the police dogs could detect the smell of decay, so he always insisted that his accomplices bury the bodies of the victims deeper. However, despite his precautions, Tommy had a weak spot. He enjoyed collecting trophies, usually jewelry, taken from his victims. This eventually helped the police catch the killer. Patera was suspected of killing 60 people, but was officially found guilty of only six. The Brooklyn court sentenced the executioner of drug dealers to life imprisonment. Giovanni Brasca, the pig and Christian killer. Giovanni was born in 1957 in Sicily. His life path was predetermined from birth. 
His father, grandfather and great-grandfather were prominent Sicilian landowners and well-known members of the Mafia. In his childhood, there was little that revealed the pathological killer in the boy. He was a chubby child who loved to eat and made loud smacking noises, earning him the nickname The Pig. Giovanni's father had close relationships with the bosses of the Corleone clan, Salvatore Rina and Bernardo Provenzano. Therefore, when Giovanni turned 20, his father arranged for him to become a driver for Bernardo. However, driving a car was only a convenient cover. In reality, Giovanni was involved in eliminating rivals and anyone who crossed the clan's path. Brasca never asked many questions and certainly never thought about the fate of his victims. He unquestioningly carried out whatever he was ordered to do and soon found himself in the Death Squad, a division of hard killers for the Mafia clan. During his work, Brasca shot the boss of the Al Camo family, who began challenging Corleone's power. A few days later, they strangled the pregnant girlfriend of the deceased so that her unborn son would not grow up seeking revenge for his father. It was Brasca who detonated the bomb in Capassi on the island of Sicily, killing the legendary Mafia fighting magistrate Giovanni Falcone. However, one of the most brutal murders he committed was in 1996. It all started when the police arrested the Mafia boss Reina and then another clan member, Santino de Matera. Santino was involved in the murder of the Mafia fighting magistrate and, to ease his own fate, agreed to cooperate with the authorities. When the Mafia members learned that Santino was planning to tell the truth, they tasked Brasca with kidnapping his 11-year-old son, Giuseppe. The killer brought the child to an abandoned cellar, where he kept him for nearly two years. During this time, he tortured the boy and sent photographs to his father. However, Santino did not retract his testimony, and in January, Brasca strangled the boy and dissolved his body in acid. During his career, Giovanni killed over a hundred people. The exact number of victims, including himself, is unknown. On May 20, 1996, the pig was arrested and sentenced to life imprisonment. However, despite this, he was released on May 31, 2021, due to his cooperation with authorities over 25 years. Bernard Hanvik, Mafia Executioner I have never seen anyone as cruel as Barry Hanvik, said a former employer of Hanvik describing how he smiled while nearly beating a person to death before killing him. Bernard Hanvik began his career as a bouncer in a bar. With his intimidating appearance and tough demeanor, he earned the nickname Barry the Bear. Hanvik would use his hefty fists for any reason. However, the things he did outside of his main job were much more terrifying. Hanvik was a mafia executioner. He took orders for murders and carried them out with the help of his accomplices. Later, he would recount throwing a death row convict through a glass showcase and then, grabbing a handful of shattered glass, forced the poor soul to eat the shards. When the victim rised in pain, Bernard struck him in the face and only then shot him in the back of the head. Police arrested Hanwick in 1982, when he was identified as the killer by miraculously surviving Alan Chaffin. According to Chaffin, Hanwick and his partner shot him and left him to die near a canal. After Hanvik's arrest, investigators stated that they suspected Bernard of involvement in over a hundred murders. However, no substantial evidence was found and the hitman was acquitted. Fifteen years later, another killer agreed to cooperate with an FBI agent and testified against Hanwick. He revealed that Barry the Bear had killed a drug dealer named Richard Diego Messina. The cocaine smuggler was found with his throat slit. After gathering undeniable evidence, the police finally apprehended the hitman. In 1999, Henwick was sentenced to life imprisonment. Although formally charged with only one murder, in reality he was responsible for the deaths of over 100 people. Barry the Bear passed away on January 2, 2013, at the age of 67, in the Batner Medical Center for Inmates in North Carolina. Next on the list is Joseph Barbosa, aka The Beast, a ruthless mafia hitman who once bit a man's cheek, earning him the nickname The Beast. Barbosa was born in 1932 in New Bedford, Massachusetts. His mother was a seamstress and his father was a boxer. Under his father's guidance, Joseph achieved some success as a light heavyweight boxer by the age of 17 and even entered the United States Boxing Association. However, due to his excessively volatile temperament, his boxing career didn't pan out. In 1950, Joe ended up in Concord State Prison for a five-year sentence for murder and robbery. But after three years, Barbosa led an escape that became the largest in the history of the prison. Along with six fellow inmates, Joseph stole amphetamine pills and, after washing them down with whiskey, attacked the guards. Fleeing the prison in two cars, the group started roaming the streets, beating random pedestrians. 
By morning, the fugitives were apprehended. While awaiting trial in prison, Joe got bored and killed a guard in the cafeteria, bludgeoning him with a stool. During his second prison term, he befriended members of Raymond Patriarch's family, who controlled the gambling underworld in Boston. Upon his release in 1958, he began working for Patriarca, hoping to be accepted into his family. Raymond turned Joe down due to his Portuguese heritage, but the killer didn't lose hope. I caught guys who were still hiding. You know, I'd knife them in the face, I'd stab their legs, I'd hit their hands, I'd stab them in the chest, you understand? Barbosa later recounted how he decided to prove his bravery to the Italian boss. In total, during his seven years working for the Patriarca clan, Joe killed 29 people. Perhaps it would have continued that way, but in 1966 he was arrested for weapons possession. Patriarca refused to post bail for his employee. FBI agents saw an opportunity to turn Barbosa against the boss. They offered him a deal. He would betray Patriarca, and in return, they would ensure his immunity and a new life in San Francisco. Barbosa agreed and provided testimony. Patriarca was sentenced to 10 years in prison along with six other mobsters. As promised, Barbosa was given a chance at a new life. However, Joe overlooked one thing. The Mafia doesn't forget betrayal. On February 11, 1976, a bullet-riddled body was found on the streets of San Francisco, the body of the mobster. Giuseppe Greco, also known as Bloody Shoe, a Sicilian mafioso who ranks third on the list of the most ruthless contract killers. And it's not without reason. He is responsible for over 300 victims. Giuseppe Greco was born in 1952 in Ciaiculi, a town on the outskirts of the Palermo province in Sicily. At that time, the Greco clan owned citrus plantations in several suburbs and was one of the most influential in the entire region. The boy's father was nicknamed Scrappa, which in Italian means shoe. Hence Giuseppe was nicknamed Shoeshine from childhood. His uncle, Michel Greco, was the boss of the Ciaiculi family and had close ties to the Corleone family. Contrary to the stereotypical portrayal of mafiosos and cultured and rough bandits, the Grecos were so refined that they were often mistaken for socialites. Their ability to conduct themselves with restraint allowed them to be friends with both politicians and gangsters. However, with the same noble calmness, they would kill anyone who stood in their way. During the Mafia's second war between 1981 and 1983, Giuseppe Greco, following in his uncle's footsteps, indiscriminately gunned down over 300 people with an AK-47. The young killer was known for his inventiveness when it came to disposing of bodies. Greco would dissolve corpses in acid baths, or sometimes dismember them and feed them to pigs. Among those who killed were Italian mafioso Stefano Bontade, the leader of the Italian Communist Party Paio La Torre, deputy commander of the Carabinieri Corps Carlo Alberto della Chiesa, and the powerful boss in the Paso family, Salvatore Inzerillo. He even killed Inzerillo's 15-year-old son, after the boy vowed to avenge his father. Before shooting him in the head, Greco first severed the boy's hand. Officially, Bloody Shoe was only found guilty of 58 murders, but he never ended up behind bars, as he was killed in 1985 by his former associates. Roy DeMio, creator of the Twin Method or Murder Conveyor, Roy DeMio was one of the most notorious mafia contract killers operating in New York, USA in the late 1970s and early 1980s. His brutal killings earned him the third spot on the list of the top five deadliest contract killers in America. The gangster whom other equally infamous criminals dared not associate with was born in Brooklyn in 1942. His parents were working-class Italians. In the early 1970s, Roy started working as a soldier for the Gambino Mafia family. Around the same time, he began investing money in the production of pornographic films. However, his tastes were, to put it mildly, unusual. He had a liking for films involving bestiality, underage participants, and snuff films, short films depicting real murders. His inclinations contradicted the principles of the Mafia, so Roy was tactfully asked to abandon his hobby. However, strange inclinations were not the only reason DeMio gained popularity in criminal circles. His methods of disposing of victims also became widely known. The killer devised a special method that came to be known as the Twin Method, named after a bar he owned. It worked as follows. Typically, the victim was invited to enter the bar through a side door. The unsuspecting person would enter a room located in the rear of the building. At that moment, one of the team members, often DeMio himself, would shoot the unfortunate individual in the head with a silenced pistol. 
After the person died, Roy would hang them by the legs in the bathroom so that all the blood would drain downward. This was done to make it easier to dismember the corpse. Next, the victim's head would be decapitated. The meal usually disposed of the head in a garbage disposal. The remaining bloodless body was placed on a tarpaulin and dismembered. Body parts were packed into plastic bags, which he then left in the supermarket dumpster. Throughout his career, DeMille killed over 200 people using this method. In the summer of 1980, FBI agents began monitoring his storage facility. However, they never managed to arrest the serial killer. In January, DeMille's frozen and bullet-riddled body was found in the trunk of a car. Richard Kuklinski, the Iceman, Manhattan's whore, and the most ruthless contract killer in human history. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree, but it rolls far away. A phrase that perfectly applies to Kuklinski. The future hitman was born in 1935 in New Jersey to a Polish and Irish family. His father was an alcoholic and an unstable psychopath. His mother was a religious fanatic. And his older brother was a convicted pedophilic murderer who raped and threw a 12-year-old girl off a roof. Richard didn't lag behind. In his free time, he tortured cats and dogs, tormenting them and burning them alive in an incinerator. At the age of 13, he killed a classmate who called him a fatso. Kuklinski beat the school bully with a metal coat hanger. After this incident, Richard ran away from home and joined a gang of juvenile delinquents. Here, he participated in robberies while honing his skills as a killer on homeless people. The youth's talent didn't go unnoticed and by the late 1960s he was working for five mafia clans. Among his regular clients were renowned families like Gambino and De Cavalcante. Even seasoned mafiosi said that Kuklinski is a real bastard and the devil incarnate. He tortured his victims and killed people for fun. Each murder brought him pleasure and tens of thousands of dollars. Once he blew up a police officer's car who had given him a ticket. Shortly after, he bludgeoned a pool player to death with a cue because the man dared to argue with him. On the day he bought a new crossbow, he killed a random passerby just to test his new weapon. Mocking a victim who started praying, Kuklinski gave Iceman an extra half hour to allow the prayer to reach the Almighty. And once Richard filmed a commercial in which he enthusiastically fed one of his victims to rats. He showed the video to Roy DeMio. However, the mafioso who had personally killed 50 people couldn't finish watching the footage because he felt nauseated. Kuklinski always approached his work creatively, using everything from firearms, poisons, fire, explosives, tools, knives and batons. His favorite method of killing was spraying the victim's nose with cyanide using a spray. He would then roll the bodies of the deceased into oil drums, dump them in mine shafts and sometimes drown them in the waters of the Hudson. But his signature move became deep freezing the corpses, earning him the nickname the Iceman. There was no direct evidence against Richard. Therefore, the police bribed an old acquaintance of the killer, who recorded a conversation on a dictaphone in which Kuklinski agreed to carry out another hit. In 1986, Richard was arrested. Despite having killed over 300 people during his 30-year career, only six of them could be proven with evidence. But it was an offer life sentence. On March 5, 2006, the lifeless body of the hitman was found on the cell floor. The autopsy revealed that Richard died of natural causes. We can all agree that contract killers are soulless, heartless psychopaths and a stark reminder of the dark side of human nature. However, what exactly drives these individuals? Is it resentment? Revenge? Thirst for attention and fame? Remains a mystery to this day. That's all from us. Wishing everyone a good mood and until the next interesting video.